Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Her name was Tabitha, and she was always doing good. She had a, a, an Aramaic, a Hebrew name, Tabitha, and because she lived in that city of Joppa, a, a thriving port city, one that would have been pretty cosmopolitan, they spoke Greek there too, so she had this Greek name, Dorcas, the one that we kind of giggle at a little bit. But both Tabitha and Dorcas mean the same thing. Mean, the, the name means gazelle. She, she, was, she was like a gazelle. Sure-footed, but, but fleet, maybe. Her name was Tabitha, her name was Dorcas, and she was always doing good. Not because she was innately perfect or something, but in a way because she knew she wasn't perfect. She, she's what Jesus spoke about last Sunday in that same chapter that we read from in our gospel this week too. It, she was the branch that was connected to the vine. And Jesus, what did he say? When, when the branch is connected to the vine, it will bear fruit, won't it? And so she did. Maybe she heard the, the news of the gospel f- directly from, from Peter on the day of Pentecost. Maybe, maybe she heard the news about, about the Savior from sin, the one who had come to die so that she could live. Maybe she heard about that from, from this caring Christian friend or neighbor that she had. But whatever it was, we know that if she was always doing good, it was because she first knew that she was a sinner that needed a Savior, that desperately needed this one who laid down his life for his friends, the one who laid down his life for her. What she needed was the one who loved her first so that she could love in this way, so that she could, so she could always be doing good like this. Now maybe Luke, Luke tells us directly that she was always doing good and helping the poor. You recognize that, that she's not given credit for doing something huge and grand and earth-shaking, universe-changing. It's not that she, had, that she had cured cancer or cured all disease or eradicated all poverty. She didn't preach a Pentecost sermon that, that converted thousands to the faith. And she didn't stand before the Sanhedrin and boldly confess her faith and die as a martyr. No, Tabitha, Dork, Dorcas, she, she simply loved those who were around her with what Jesus had given her. In the simplest way, she loved those who were around her with what Jesus had made her to be. So she could sew. She could make clothing. So that's what she did. She made clothing for the poor who couldn't afford it on their own. She made clothing for the widows, those that had no one to care for them. I'm guessing that, that she had heard the encouragement that Jesus had given his disciples. I'm guessing she maybe had even heard uh, an early version of those words that John would write in his epistle. You know, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God, knows God. For whoever does not love doesn't know God because God is love. Tabitha, she loved simply because she had been born of God. She had been brought to faith in the promise of the Redeemer, the Savior who had died for her. She put her trust in him. She was born of God and so she loved in the same way that all of those who are born of God are encouraged to love, to love with what God has given them, to love with what Jesus has made them to be. 
And so when this, this loving God allowed Tabitha to become sick, and keep in mind, this is something that a loving God can do and still remain loving. This loving God had allowed this wonderful loving woman to get sick and even die. And even there we say, a loving God does this too sometimes. Because our lives are more than just being healthy. And the promises that we have are more than just for this life. They include a life that is never going to end. Jesus' own words, whoever believes in me will live even though they die. They will live and never die. But when this this loving God allowed this loving woman to get sick, she died. And those that she had loved, they grieved. And they mourned their loss. Not her loss, but their loss. Her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. They had heard that the man of God, that Peter, was, was, was preaching and teaching that he was staying in that city that was nearby, that city of Lydda. And so they sent for him. <laughs> they pleaded, please, they said, please come. What were they asking for? We don't know. Were they asking for, for Peter to come and perform a miracle? Maybe, but, but we don't read that in the text. Maybe they were just asking for Peter to come and remind them and comfort them with the message of the one who had defeated death for them and for Tabitha as well. Whatever the reason, that man of God came to them because that's what he was there to do. And in that upper room, we are given like privy to to the most touching scene. All the widows stood around, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Just achingly beautiful, this scene. What they're doing, how they're doing it. You know, they're not sitting around just bragging about how beautiful this woman was. They're not talking about, boy, she had the nicest house you're ever going to see. She was so wealthy, you should see the wealth that she accumulated in her life. They're not there talking about how she was remembered as somebody who never lost an argument. She was always right. She was so smart. None of those things. No, the thing that she was remembered for was her love. Look at how she loved us, they were saying again and again. Just look at how she loved us. So Peter sent everybody out of the room. He got down on his knees and he prayed to the one who had defeated death for her and for us. He prayed to the one who had ripped the jaws right out of death so that it could never hold those that belonged to him. He prayed and then he spoke words that even sound a little bit like Jesus when he was in the the room sitting on the edge of the bed of uh, Jairus, the the daughter of Jairus who had died. You remember what he said in that? He said in in, in the Aramaic, he said, Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, get up. Peter even sounds like Jesus when he says, Tabitha, get up. And so she did. He called all the believers and especially the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. Jesus had returned her life to her, not Peter. Jesus had done this and people knew it. Jesus had returned her life to her so that she could go on loving those who were around her as she had done before, loving them with what he had made her to be. We look at this and we would say, this is Jesus' compassionate love. Love for those who are in need. Love for those who are poor. Love for those who need someone caring for them. And Jesus was providing it. 
in this case, in this miraculous way, giving him, them back, giving her back to them. This is his compassionate love on display. But do you notice the even greater use of this power and the miracle that Jesus performs through Peter? Luke records in Acts, this became known. It was a thing. People talked about it. People heard about it. People knew this is evidence that what Peter says comes from the one who crushed death. That what Peter preaches, the one Peter preaches about, is the one who defeated death so that those who believe in him are never going to be held in death. The one that Peter preaches about is the one and only Redeemer and Savior of sinners. This became known, and many people believed. What a wonderful thing we we see at work here. Even even Jesus' own words, he, he says, let your light shine before men, before humans, before the world. And what they're going to end up doing is praising your Father in heaven. And so it is with even this miracle. So love those that are around you with what Jesus has given you with what Jesus has made you to be. You take stock of that. Maybe, maybe you have a very, a very specific skill or a bunch of skills that can be of wonderful use to others around you. Maybe you, you just have been blessed with a, a wisdom that is, that is able to, to, to help people find their way, a wisdom that can be put to use to love. Maybe the Lord has blessed you with an abundance of wealth that that can be of of great help to those who need it, a great help to those who proclaim this gospel around the world. Maybe you just have been blessed with extra time with which you can listen or encourage or pray. Whatever it is, what you have, He's given you. He has filled you up with these gifts for the purpose of of loving those that are around you and giving glory to his name. The Apostle Paul would say that we we are to be living our lives like like living sacrifices. Instead of uh, taking the sacrifice and putting it on the altar and burning it up to God, you are pouring yourself out as a living sacrifice, one that is of a benefit to everyone around you that brings glory to him. Paul would say we all have different gifts according to the grace that is given to us. If, if If a man's gift is preaching, he says, let him preach. If it's serving let them serve. If someone is a good teacher, let them teach. If it is encouraging, let them encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, go ahead and do it generously, he says. If it's leadership that you've been blessed with, govern diligently. If it's showing mercy to others, then do it cheerfully. Let your love be sincere, Paul says. Be devoted to one another in love. We do this because we've been washed clean of all of our guilt and all of our failure, all of our shame, all of our sin. So love as you have been loved. And when, when you and I fail to do that perfectly, as we, we certainly will fail from time to time, know and remember that his love is greater than your sin. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God bless you as you do so. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.